Good morning, everyone. And uh, my name is Carl Leon. I'm a volunteer with Seattle's Office of Emergency Management. I have told you this already, but I've been doing this for about 10 years. And I have talked to a thousand or more people over the years giving this presentation. Um, this is a generic emergency disaster preparedness presentation. It has uh, some amount of focus on earthquakes, but that's certainly not the only disaster or concern that we should prepare for or be aware of. Um, we're going to talk about things you can do to prepare, better prepare in advance should something happen. Making a plan, knowing, anticipating the different things that might happen, and then planning ahead on what you might do should those things happen is even if your plan doesn't go exactly as you laid it out is going to make a difference it's going to help you approach whatever's going on more calmly learning about what life safety essentials you might need and what to do about that learning how to stay safe yourself in an earthquake and or in other situations and we've got a pandemic going on right now which i think you've all figured out and and it's definitely had an impact on how you lead your daily lives and how to stay safe after an earthquake. So there's a couple of quick links I'm gonna put up on the screen. And I have emailed a copy of this presentation to Kenon so they can provide each of you a copy of this and you get the links at, at that point in time. Um, my name's Carl Leon and you can email me if you wish directly. Uh, you can go to the City of Seattle's website, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, or you can email the Office of Emergency Management, the center link there, oem at seattle.gov, and the Office of Emergency Management can respond to questions or concerns. Now, the website, seattle.gov slash emergency, is not going to take you there. It's going to take you here. And you go to the emergency management website and you'll look under that there are some drop down menus here and the one about preparation for disasters and so forth is prepare and if you click prepare it takes you to their preparedness website there's a variety of links that you can follow to get a lot more information there's a video which i'm actually going to show you in just a minute there's a link to the various hazards which we'll talk about information about community hubs, the infographic, which is the handout, and that's also been emailed to your to Canon, but you can download it here. And if you click this link about the infographics, you will see that it is available in a variety of languages. So if you would prefer it in something besides English, you can download it easily at the Seattle website, Office of Emergency Management website. So there's a lot of information on this website for you to look at. And I mentioned the video, so let me just quickly show the video. This is really the entire presentation in about two minutes. And there's a lot of good information in it, but it's a little fun way to present it. And let me make sure my computer sound is coming through. It Actually, let me come up here and share computer sound. Now it should be. Here we go. Our city may not face a Sasquatch attack anytime soon, but Seattle can experience major earthquakes. What can you do to prepare? Plan ahead. You should be prepared to be on your own for seven to 10 days. Stash a supply of water, canned food, and other emergency supplies. Oh, and don't forget to secure your heavy furniture to walls. When things get unsteady, connecting with others is crucial. Start with a snap. Put those furry phalanges away. SNAP stands for Seattle Neighborhoods Actively Prepare. SNAP is a group of neighbors who've agreed to work together following a disaster. Members of SNAP groups all bring something different to the table. Plus, you'll finally get a chance to return that drill you borrowed from Barb. SNAP presentations can be requested from the Office of Emergency Management at any time. Once you take care of your home and neighborhood, go to the nearest community emergency hub. Community emergency hubs are locations designated by community members where people can meet to share information and resources in the aftermath of an emergency. Don't have a hub or SNAP group in your community? 
contact Seattle Emergency Management to get things moving. But wait, there's more. You can also sign up for Alert Seattle, the city's official emergency notification system. Enroll online to receive free alerts from the city via text message, email, voice message, or social media. Still feel like you aren't ready? Seattle Office of Emergency Management organizes disaster skills workshops all over the city. Learn useful skills like how to use a fire extinguisher, how to care for and respond to injuries after a disaster, how much water to keep on hand, and how to control your utilities. Being prepared for disasters, like an earthquake, is the best way to keep from shaking in your boots. Visit the Seattle Office of Emergency Management website to learn more. Okay. Get my slides back up. And move on. So we're gonna talk about everything you saw in that little video, but it's, it's available on the website and it's a quick and easy presentation that touches on all the important points that we need to discuss. Um, Seattle is vulnerable to many disasters. FEMA put out a long list of disasters and Seattle evaluated that list and there's only one thing on the list of FEMA hazards and disasters that is not a risk in Seattle. That one thing is hurricanes. We don't get hurricanes here. Everything else on the list is something that we could experience. Earthquakes is at the top of the list. Now this list is actually prioritized and the prioritization is based on a combination of factors, how often it happens, how bad things can be if it does happen, financial impacts to the city and so forth. And they sit down and they put it all into formula and they come up with this priority. Earthquakes is at the top of the list because if they happen, they can be really, really bad. They don't happen very often. Snow and ice happens virtually every winter. And that's why it's so high in the list as do windstorms. So you scan down the list and you can see the various things that can affect your life, that can affect your health, that can affect your safety. And being aware of these and preparing in advance, having a plan and having some supplies available for these is going to make your ability to to work through them and come out the other end of them much better. So we'll talk uh, not so much about the individual hazards. We'll touch on earthquakes and a little bit on disease outbreaks because we're experiencing one, but preparation for anything is preparation for everything. So just keep that in mind. Earthquakes, there are three general categories or types of earthquakes that we could experience in this area the crustal or shallow earthquake, which could be produced by the Seattle fault line, which runs directly under the center and south part of Seattle, but would affect the entire city and region. Uh, those happen very rarely, but they could produce a magnitude seven or so earthquake, which is a very serious earthquake. And we could expect massive amounts of damage in the city if we had a Seattle fault earthquake. Intraplate or deep earthquakes, the Nisqually quake about 10 years ago or more, it was a deep earthquake. They happen about every 30 to 50 years. I'm a Seattle native. I've lived here most of my life. And I've been through three magnitude six or greater earthquakes in Seattle. They were all deep earthquakes. They tend not to produce a lot of damage, but they get your attention. Um, and like I say, they happen semi-frequently. And then the, what are called subduction zone or mega thrust earthquakes. And that's what can happen with the Cascadia subduction zone, which runs along the entire Pacific coast from partway up British Columbia all the way down into Northern California. That can produce a magnitude nine or greater earthquake, such as what happened in Japan. Um, it can produce a massive tsunami flooding, especially along coastal regions that happened also you saw in Japan. And that is a very serious risk. Those happen about every 300 years. We are potentially due for any one of these type of earthquakes based on the calendar, you know, but the good news is earthquakes can't read calendars. So you can't, you say they can happen so every so often on average, but 
that doesn't mean you can predict when they're going to happen. It's just like the lotto. I never win the lotto, even the chances are one in three or something when you buy a ticket. So you can't predict when they're gonna happen, just that they will happen. We will have eventually another interplate deep quake. We may, we will have a subduction zone quake. We will have a shallow quake, whether or not they happen in our lifetime or in our ancestors' lifetimes, we don't know. What these can do, what problems they can cause where you live, you can, Seattle has an interactive map, the um, Hazard Explorer, seattle.gov slash Hazard Explorer link. You can go online and with this map, you can zoom in to any specific location in the city of Seattle and see what risks you are subject to. It shows liquefaction, flooding, fire, landslide, very all the different earth um, hazards that could happen with or without an earthquake and what you can do to some degree to prepare for those different hazards. So this is a worthwhile spending a few minutes looking at the Hazard Explorer and seeing what the hazards are at your location. King County has a website also hazardready.org slash Seattle. And on that website, you type your address in and it gives you tabs that shows the different hazards and also what you can do to prepare for them. So those are both very useful tools that you can go through and evaluate the risks uh, that you potentially face at your locations. So what's gonna happen if we have a really bad earthquake? And what I'm gonna talk about now is like the worst case scenario. It's extremely unlikely that the worst case scenario is going to happen, but if you know how bad it could be, you can prepare for everything up to that point. And you can't be perfectly prepared for everything. There's no possible way. But the more you're aware of what you might need, the more you can prioritize what you do do to prepare for um, the reality of an after earthquake disaster. So you're not going to be able to get around. Roads are going to be damaged. Bridges are going to be out. Don't expect the freeway to work because most of it is overpasses or underpasses, which will collapse. So it's going to be very difficult to get around. Mobility is going to be primarily by foot for a while. Stores are going to quickly run out of stuff. You see on the news, if a hurricane's coming to the Gulf Coast, they clean out the stores three or four days before it gets there. We don't get a three or four day warning for an earthquake. We get a 10 second warning. So what's going to happen for us is right after the earthquake, stores are going to run short on supplies. And being aware of that and having a stock of supplies in advance is going to make life better for you. It's just like if everybody had had a case of toilet paper on hand in March, nobody would have run short, right? They wouldn't have had to run, have a run on, on that commodity at the stores. Utilities are going to be damaged. Water, sewer, electricity, connectivity, internet, telephones, all are probably going to stop working for some period of time brief or long term, we don't know. Christchurch, New Zealand had a shallow earthquake, a seven magnitude earthquake at about a year before the Japan earthquake, and they are still recovering from that. Some of their horizontal infrastructure, water and sewer, is still being rebuilt. That's 10 years, and it could take Seattle that long to recover. Gas stations are probably not going to work. ATM machines are probably not going to work. And the reason is they rely on plastic. And plastic's not going to work. And the reason is the ATM machines and this cash uh, where you use your credit card at the store requires connectivity. That when you swipe your credit card, a message goes from that machine all the way to your bank and it says, please send this much money over to their bank and their bank gets it and sends the message back saying, we got the money and you complete your transaction. Without communications working, that's not gonna work. So plastic's not gonna work. Having some cash on hand is probably going to be very important. We're gonna become a cash only society for some period of time. Hospitals will probably be overwhelmed. They already are with COVID, but if we had um, an earthquake disaster with many injuries, 
that's just going to compound the situation. So you're going to become each other's caregivers. If you know a doctor or a nurse or EMT that lives in your community, that's good because they're going to become your care provider. Knowing basic first aid is something everyone should know. And for the Canon Center, I would suggest if you haven't had one, maybe you arrange to get a first aid CPR class for your community. Being able to render basic first aid is going to be how you save each other's lives until more advanced medical care can be brought to bear. I mentioned phones, cable TV, internet are probably not going to work, at least initially. Um, there's a lot of capacity out there to restore cell coverage with temporary cell sites, but they are not going to serve everybody. And a lot of service is going to be very intermittent at best for a period of time after a disaster. So you should plan on having alternate means of communications, alternate means of getting a hold of people or letting them know you're okay. Um, having the having an out of area contact, somebody that lives east of the mountains and Bellingham won't qualify because you'll be subject to a Cascadia quake. Having somebody east of the mountains in Eastern Washington or farther east as a contact, you can let them know somehow that you're okay. They can let everybody else know that you're okay. Not doesn't require you to call a hundred people all around the country or world or for them to call you. And by reducing the number of communications attempts in the area, it's gonna free up what little communications resources there are. So the fewer phone calls you can make, if you can make them at all, the better. Texting is probably gonna work better than voice phone calls. Once connectivity starts to come back, online resources are going to become very valuable resources, but they're not gonna be available at it initially and for some period of time. Um, cell phones, if you don't have a way to recharge them, it's important to be able to keep the charge on them for when you do have service. So if you don't have any signal bars, turn your phone completely off and save the battery. Turn it back on in a couple of hours, see if you have a signal. No signal, turn it back off. You can make a cell phone last for a week or two by only turning it on very briefly, making a call or communicating and turning it back off because you may not have a way to easily recharge it for a while. So keep that in mind. Don't let it go dead the first day. First responders, fire, police, ambulance are not going to be available for you for some period of time. And again, we don't know how long it's going to depend on what type of emergency or disaster we have. But again, I'm, I'm just telling you the absolute worst case situation here just so you're aware how bad it could potentially be. So if we really have a really bad earthquake, don't count on first responders to be available. Seattle only has two or 300 police and firefighter on patrol or in fire stations at any given time. And if everybody else is like the rest of us, we live and go wherever. And if we have a really bad earthquake, they may not even, firefighters and police may not even be able to respond to the city to reinforce the people that were on duty. So there will be very limited resources for a period of time. So that's the doom and gloom, and I'm not trying to scare anybody, so don't be scared. But being aware of the potential for all of these things means you should make a plan. You should figure out in advance, what am I gonna do if that does happen? What am I gonna do if I can't drive someplace? What am I gonna do if my phone doesn't work? What am I going to do if I can't get to the pharmacy or the doctor's office or the wherever, the grocery store? What am I going to do? And if you know that, if you've got a plan in advance, then you can start working on that plan if the situation ever actually happens. You should have a meeting place. You and your family, if you live in a if you live in a like a single residence, you and your family should have a meeting place nearby right outside your residence or within a, that block or something. If you live in a community building, a multi-dwelling uh, occupant uh, housing, you should have a meeting place near that outside the building where you can count noses, figure out who's present, who's not, and who's not accounted for. 
So getting a meeting place you can all go to is your first step in reuniting with your family or with your community. Know what you do to do for utility disruptions. The reality is in a bad earthquake, the water's not going to work. So you should have some supply of water on hand. The recommendation is a gallon of water per person per day for two weeks. That's not reasonable for many people to store. You don't have the space to do that. Well, store whatever you can. If you are in a house or your own unit has a hot water heater, the hot water heater can be a source of 20, 30, 40 gallons of water. If you don't have that, again, stocking what you can stock, having a couple of cases of bottled water is better than nothing. That at least gets you through the initial period of time. Um, what if you don't have power? Do you have, what do you have that requires power that's essential? I mean, essential. Do you have a oxygen machine? That's essential. And if it requires power and you don't have power, what are you gonna do about that? Do you do kidney dialysis at home? Some people do. That requires power. So think about the power critical, life safety power critical items you have and what are you, what's your backup plan for those? Um, generators require fuel. I mean, there's it, it's almost impossible to have a two week preparation for that kind of stuff. But if you've got a two day preparation with batteries or whatever, that might allow you to find the next resource where you can get power or recharge or whatever. So having a plan, knowing what you're going to do first off right away is going to help you get to the next step of, of, of recovery. So planning in advance is really important. If you have children um, at school, knowing what the school's plans are is essential. They are not gonna release your child to someone unless they're on the list authorized to pick them up. So talk to the school, know what it is. If you work outside the home, know what your place of business's plans are. The building's plans, the company's plans, all are important for you to know and share. The Kinon has a plan for their community center. They need to make sure that all of the people that use that community center is aware of what their plans are. So this is all important planning in advance because the more you do it in advance, the better prepared you're gonna to be to face the situation, whatever it is when it happens. And if you, even if your plan can't work exactly as it, was laid out, it's a starting point that you can start adapting to whatever the situation is. And hopefully none of us ever see the worst case scenario, but being prepared for anything is gonna be making much better prepared for anything, something. Know your neighborhood's plan. Seattle has a program called SNAP, Seattle Neighborhoods Actively Prepare, and it's all about neighbors working with neighbors on how they can come together and respond in a disaster or an emergency. That is one of the things that Seattle is working very hard to have outreach to other language communities, other cultural groups within the city that are not as easily interfaced with by this type of a presentation where you have to be English speaking. They have representatives who can come to you to your community center, for example, and speak to you in another language that works better for your community center and give this information and work with your community in their native languages to make them better understand and work together as a community. And as a community, you should know how to work together with each other to help each other through the initial phases of a disaster until other help or resources can be brought to bear. Seattle has a volunteer grassroots effort. It's not run by the city called Seattle Emergency Hubs. And this was started in West Seattle about 10 or 12 years ago. And these are now throughout the city and it's all volunteer. It's just people in the community have come together and organized. And what it is is a meeting place or a gathering place that people can go to to start working together to restore some normalcy to your life following an emergency or a disaster. Having a communications plans, I talked about this briefly already. 
um, using texts uses a lot less of the capacity of your phone than does a voice phone call. If I want to pick up my phone and make a physical phone call to Patty in Bellingham right now, both of our phones have to be working on the phone system at the same time for that call to go through. If we're in a disaster and there's a lot of damage to the telephone infrastructure, it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. But if I try to send Patty a text, that text is going to sit in my phone and wait until it gets connection to the system. Then that text is going to be looking for Patty's phone. And when it finds it, it will send that text down to her. It's not going to happen in five seconds like it does in normal day to day life, but that text will probably go through to her, whereas a phone call probably won't go through to her. So texting can be a very valuable way to pass information if you have any cellular capability at all. Have emergency contact lists. Ever since we become dependent on these things, all of our memories in here. How many people remember phone numbers? I mean, I grew up with rotary dial phones and a lifetime of remembering phone numbers, and I don't remember very many anymore because this remembers them for me. Well, if this isn't working, where am I going to get that phone number? Have a list of, of emergency numbers written down so that if you can get your access to any phone that works, you know, your doctor's phone number, your pharmacy's phone number, your insurance agent's phone number, your banker's phone number, whatever the most important contacts that you might have, have a written list of all of that. Have a written list of all your medications. Have a written list of everything that you have online that you may not have access to if online isn't there. So part of the planning and advance process. Social media and video calling, wonderful tools. Again, they may or may not be available in a disaster or an emergency. And video calling, video conferencing uses more bandwidth, if you will, than does texting. So again, the more capability, the, the more you can plan in advance and having an out-of-area contact and things like that, the less you're going to rely on these communication requirements in a disaster or until normal communications start to become restored. When they do start coming back, social media can be a very useful tool. A lot of information you can be that uh, you can obtain through it and start organizing where you're going to go next. Speaking of social media, Seattle has something called Alert Seattle. This is voluntary. You have to opt into it, sign up for it. But Alert Seattle will send you a text or an email or a voice phone call when there is something urgent enough to put out that type of information. You tell it what you want. I want a text, I want a phone call, I want an email, I want all three, whatever. It will do that. When do they send them out? Really severe weather alerts, public safety alerts, like there's a hazardous material situation two blocks from the Kinon Community Center. They could send that alert out so that you're aware in your neighborhood that there is a hazard and to avoid it. They will use Alert Seattle infrequently, but when it's important to get information out to the community in general. Um, but you have to sign up for it. You have to opt into using Alert Seattle. You could go to the website alert.seattle.gov and sign up for it. I encourage everyone to do that. Okay, a little bit more about earthquakes. You need to make sure your home is safe, your work environment is safe. Look around you right now, and I'm a horrible example where I'm sitting. You can't see it, fortunately, in that I have all kinds of stuff that could fall on me if we had an earthquake. You don't want that environment. You want to secure large furniture and wall hangings so they can't fall on you, kitchen cabinets and contents so that maybe their cabinets are childproof latches or RV or marine type latches that you have to physically unlatch something to get the door to open. That way, if we have a really bad earthquake, stuff's not going to fall out of those cabinets. Securing your water heater, securing washers, dryers, and stoves so that they don't move around and fall over during an earthquake. Um, go on a hazard hunt when this presentation is over and figure out just what is there in my area that's a risk that could hurt me if it fell down. I'm gonna show you two short videos. This, these are both a, a 
test house they built on a shake table. It's a full-sized house and it mimics the um, Loma Perita earthquake in California of, of about 10 years ago also. It's a seven magnitude earthquake. So what you can see from that is if it's not bolted down or fastened, it's gonna fall down. And if it falls down, it could hurt you. You'll see the water heater fell over. If it's a gas water heater, it may have broken the gas line when it fell over. If it's electric, it may cause sparks that could cause a fire. So there's all kinds of reasons to, to secure things and make sure that you have a safe environment. Um, the next slide is a video of a bedroom in the same house. Um, here's a bed down in the bottom right corner. So what is on the floor right now? Everything. It's not safe to even get out of bed and walk someplace, assuming you live through those speakers falling on you. So again, what's safe and what's unsafe? What hazards can you mitigate in advance so they aren't hazards in an earthquake? And then having by your bed a pair of good shoes, because if you tried to walk out of that house after an earthquake, foot hazards are going to be an extreme risk. So having a good pair of shoes by your bed and maybe a pair of gloves or something so that you have a little bit of safe clothing to get you able to evacuate the house. Oops, there we go. So what about insurance and government assistance? Don't plan on FEMA being the answer to your prayers. They, their limit, first of all, they gotta get a disaster declared, they've gotta respond. The maximum they're gonna, that you're gonna get out of them is, out of them is about $35,000 for a total loss. Um, you need to have homeowners or renters insurance to protect your stuff and know what your insurance covers and does not. Most of them do not cover earthquakes. So you have to have a separate rider to protect from earthquakes. Um, so talk to an insurance agent to make sure your insurance coverage is suitable for you. And it's a balancing act because the more you protect against, the more it costs. Maybe you're better off not protecting against it and just gambling or covering your own self-insuring, whatever. These are all personal choices, but be aware of what is and what is not going to be available and what you can do in advance to prepare yourself for a disaster situation if you have damage or loss to your home. What should you stock? We talked about water already. You need to have some water on hand. If you turn the faucet on and it doesn't give you water, what are you gonna do? And having some water is essential, it's critical. Having some amount of food. Most of us can live a day or two without water. Most of us can live a week or two without food. Um, some, of, some of us, like myself, it probably wouldn't hurt if I went a few days without food, especially after Thanksgiving. Having a way to stay warm and dry. Seattle in the winter is a cold and wet place. You can get what's called hypothermia. That is a life safety risk if you have hypothermia. Being able to stay warm and dry, or if you get cold and wet, being able to get warm and dry is really important. So having the proper clothing, having, having a way to stay dry, uh, shelter is all important. Having a safe light source, candles, anything that burns is not safe. Don't set those up after an earthquake because an aftershock can knock them over and start a fire. Personal sanitation products. Again, in a worst case scenario, the, the bathroom may not work, the toilet may not work. And you need, you're, you're, hopefully you're not gonna stop working, so you're still gonna be producing waste. You need to have a plan on how to deal with that waste. Having, um, a supply of plastic bags that you can line your toilet with and use and take them out and, 
and dispose of them in accordance with whatever instructions may be the way you have to deal with sanitation for some period of time. Again, worst case scenarios, but having a plan in advance is going to help you should the need arise sometime. So build a kit. Be prepared to be on your own for two weeks. That's the recommendation. And it doesn't have to be normal comforts of everyday life for two weeks. It has to be what do I absolutely have to have to last two weeks? Because it may take that long before you start getting any kind of resupply or, or emergency aid coming to, to with food and water or whatever. Um, that's gonna be different for everybody. If you don't have supplies now, it may be costly to go out and get supplies. So don't try to build a complete supply kit in one day. Do it as you are capable and able to do it. Medications, what do you use every day? And I'm gonna talk about medications again in a minute. I have a variety of prescription medications. I'm senior citizen also, been retired since 19, 19, 2005. Um, every time I see my doctor, I get on another pill and some of them really matter. So having a supply of medications is really important. Where do you keep all this stuff? Keep some of it at home. Have a base where your primary supplies are. If you have a car, keep a kit in your car. That way, wherever you are, you've got some stuff with you. Have a personal preparedness bag that you can carry with you. Okay, stays put. Uh, a get home bag. So wherever you're at, you can get back to either your car or your home. This is a little preposterous. I put it in a humor. This is my get home bag. And it's just a very small backpack that I can carry any place I go. And inside of it, the little plastic container I'm holding up in there, I've got a week's worth of prescription medications. That goes with me wherever I'm at. If I'm not home, that backpack is with me and those prescription meds are with me. So if I get trapped someplace, I live north of the ship canal in the north end of the city. If I go into town, if I go south of the ship canal and we have a really bad earthquake, it might take me a week to get back home because transportation is going to be down, bridges are going to be down. It could be a real challenge for me to get home where I have more medications and other stuff. So having something with you that's most important all the time and more at the next stage in your car or wherever at your work, if you work outside the home, having something at your work, if you travel between two residences, having some amount of supplies, pick one is maybe your primary, but having some amount of supplies at each one would be relevant or important to you, et cetera. So again, the plan has to be very personalized. What works for you? The kit has to be very personalized. What works for you? This is just an example of part of what works for me. I have a detached garage outside my house. That's where my wife keeps a wonderful kit that could probably last us a month or more. She's more conscious of that than I am. I have a kit in her car, I have a kit in my car, and I have this backpack. That's how I prepare and how I stage it out different places. Again, what works for you is gonna be different than what works for me, but have something that works for you. If you live in an apartment or a condo type of residence, maybe having a kit that's in a, either a backpack you can grab or a wheelable suitcase you can take with you and keeping that in a closet near your door so you can grab it as you leave would give you a supply of essential goods that you could take with you very easily. And you may have more tucked in closets and cook nooks and crannies all over, but having something you can that's movable you can evacuate with you might be important. So make it work for you, for your environment, for your home, for your whatever. COVID guidance. I think we're all pretty aware of all of this stuff already because we've been dealing with it all year, but it's not over. You have to take it seriously. Wear a face covering whenever you're out of your home out of, out with anybody other than the immediate people you live with in the same residence. It's mandatory in public places statewide, and it does help two ways, protect you and protect others from you. Always keep practicing safe personal hygiene, wash your hands very frequently, use uh, sanitation aids if you can't wash right away, 
stay, if you have uh, medical conditions, be even more careful, keep your medications available and limit who you gather with for any type of recreational uh, activities in or out of your house. They recommend now you don't even have anybody except your immediate family that you live together with you even for the holidays, which is very difficult. Before we started, one of the people on, on the meeting mentioned that they had a like three and three and a half or three and three quarter hour Zoom on Thanksgiving with a very large family. Perfect. Everybody got to see each other, share with their experiences, and yet you weren't exposing each other to risk. That's the way to do it. Helping your neighbors during COVID and, and other times, any, any time, being able to help your neighbor, neighbors is important. And if you are able to give help, let your neighbors know that. Hey, don't hesitate to call me if, if you need something. If you are a person who needs help, and you have neighbors that might be able to give you that help, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Establish those relationships in advance so that if the time comes and the need arises, you can do that. There's this document here, this card that is available from the Office of Emergency Management that we can send copies to you to distribute in your community so people can help connect people with each other to get and give help as needed. So can on, feel free to call OE or email OEM at seattle.gov and ask for some of these to be sent to your community center. And you can, have, you can distribute them to your, um, to your community members. What to do during an earthquake. If we actually have an earthquake, you want to try to get under something, something fairly sturdy, drop, cover and hold. The whole idea is you wanna protect yourself from stuff that can fall on you. You don't want to be the object that everything lands on. You want it to land on something above you so that you're safe. If you can't get under something, go to an inside wall and get down low and protect yourself. Get beside something that can protect you like a sofa or a couch. Get between rows of chairs if you're in a theater or a church or anything like that. Community center where there's rows of chairs. Anything that stuff can land on before it hits you to protect you. That's the whole idea. Now, if the whole building collapses, a, a table isn't going to protect you. But you know what? If the artificial ceiling falls and, and the building stands, that table is going to protect you from whatever falls and it doesn't hit you and you don't get injured. So drop, cover, and hold. After the earthquake, dust yourself off. Check on those immediately around you. Are you okay? Do you need help? Check your home building or whatever and see if there's property damage. Is it safe to remain inside or is it, does it make sense to leave the building uh, until you can determine if it's safe? I mentioned dressing for safety. Dress safely and go to your meeting place and meet up with everybody else that you expect to be meeting up with and see who doesn't show up. And then you can start making plans on how to look for them or help them. Know about controlling utilities. Um, if you're in an individual household, you're going to have a water shutoff valve. You should know where that valve is and you should turn your water off after an earthquake. The reason is you want to protect whatever water is inside your home. Uh, water in the toilet tanks, water in the water heater, water in the pipes is all water that can be part of your two week supply of water. Shutting your water valve off will keep it from draining out of your house if the water mains outside are broken. Shutting off your gas. Know where your gas shut off is if you have gas and know how to shut the gas off, but don't shut it off unless you are aware of a gas leak. You smell gas, shut it off. You hear hissing from a gas pipe, shut it off. In the absence of some indicator, they recommend you leave the gas on. And the reason is, if you shut it off, you're not supposed to turn it back on. You're supposed to wait for the gas company. And that might be a while if we really have a bad earthquake. So keeping your gas on may be able to let you keep cooking and keep heating your home and whatever. If you shut it off, you can't turn it back on to, to do those things. Check to see if your home has sustained structural damage. Again, knowing your neighbors, knowing your community, 
is there somebody in your community? You know, first of all, you can look at your home and, and use common sense. If it's still straight up and down, it probably may be safe to go back in. If it's at a crazy angle, it probably isn't safe to go back in. But even if it's straight up and down, uh, a, an architect, a civil engineer, somebody like that can look at a residence and see a lot more is it safe than just the average you or me. So know your neighbors. Do you have somebody in your neighborhood, uh, a general contractor, anybody that might be able to help assess the safety of a residence or a structure? Know your neighbors. Do you have a doctor or a nurse or an EMT in your neighborhood? Know your neighbors. Do you have an electrician or a carpenter or a plumber in your neighborhood? It's amazing when you bring a group of people together, the diversity of knowledge and skills that are in that group. And that's part of what community means for, for coming out of a disaster and doing well going on afterwards. So know your community and work with your community following a disaster. Find out more information. We talked about Alert Seattle. All of the city departments have social media accounts, Twitter accounts. If you use that, you can follow them on social media. If you have nothing else after an earthquake or a disaster, tune into a local radio or television station any important information that's coming out from the city will come out over AM and FM radio stations. So having a portable radio, battery powered radio, it should be part of your emergency kit. And find out where the nearest hub, there's um, the Rainier Valley area. There's several hubs. They are getting more organized than they were. They were some of the last neighborhoods to come online with this, but there are some hubs and you can go to the map that's on that link there and it's in the link, the handout that I emailed to you all, um, to the Kenan Center. Uh, that will take you to a map that shows where hubs are. Find out where the nearest hub is. Be able to go there. That might be where you can start connecting with community in a disaster. Disaster skills training. The city offers a variety of classes. They are infrequent and they are whole, a whole lot less this year, but they have them all online and there's links to every one of these classes. And again, the next slide shows all the specific links. You can go and watch these online classes and learn about how to use a fire extinguisher, how to shut off your gas, how to shut off your water, how to do temporary emergency toileting. A class called Stop the Bleed is a life-saving class if you have someone with arterial, ble arterial bleeding. Um, learn light search and rescue skills. That's like how to get somebody out from under a collapsed bookcase. It's not how to get somebody out of a collapsed building, but having some light search and rescue skills so that you can help your neighbors, so that you can work with each other. All of these are important skills and important training. When COVID's over, these will be in-person classes again. Right now, they're all online classes that you can take. And there's the direct links to all of those classes and you can type them into your web browser or whatever, or from the email I sent of this, they may be clickable links, they may, may not be, I'm not sure, but they're all available. If you go to the emergency management website, you can get to all of these through that website. If you are interested in doing what I'm doing, volunteering and helping people, you can contact Carrie Brazel and she can process you in as a volunteer. So. If you're looking for a volunteer opportunity, Seattle is always looking for volunteers to help do this stuff. With that, nobody has asked any questions in chat and nobody's interrupted me to ask questions. So I'm gonna stop talking and let you start. Questions? Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay, that's all right too. Don't be afraid to ask, but you can email direct, email me directly with questions if you want. Um, there's a survey you can take. Uh, you can click that QR code or you can go to that website and answer the survey about this presentation. Was it useful? Was it worth your time? Was I the worst guy you ever had to listen to in your life? You know, meaningful questions and important questions, but they do like the feedback because that's the only way we can improve these presentations and make them better for you uh, going forward, better for the community. And here's the links I gave you um, at the beginning of the presentation. Here they are again, the seattle.gov slash emergency website, my email address, and the previous slide uh, survey monkey link. There it is again. You can 
go to the website and do the survey monkey. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of my presentation. So I'll leave this up for another 10 or 15 seconds if you want to write anything down. And then I will stop sharing my screen and we'll go back to a normal Zoom. And again, I'm open to questions at any time. Where's my stop share link? Okay, the ladies at Canon have these slides so you can get these links from them also. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was great. You're, you're most welcome. And um, all of you have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful holiday season. Be safe. Um, don't hesitate to follow up with me if you have questions going down the road. You've got my email address. I'm happy to, to respond anytime. And I wish you all just a wonderful December and a happy end of COVID. And like I say, Kenon has a copy, a PDF copy of this presentation. It's available to you. You can get most of this information off the Seattle website, make use of it, research and follow up. And then if you have questions after you've had a chance to digest it longer, feel free to email me. I'm happy to, happy to respond to anybody with any questions or suggestions. Um, the only thing I can't do is come out and build your kit for you. You got to do that. 